what does it mean? It means that we're not focused on pleasure, that when, you know, sex education is taught, it's, it's anatomical, it's procreational, and nobody talks about pleasure. But it just so happens for men that procreational sex and sex for pleasure is really amounts to the same thing. For people with vulvas, pleasure is a lot more complicated. Hello there, everybody. It's Christine Marie Mason, your host for the Rose Woman podcast, where every week we open up a little bit more of our being, blossom a little bit more, soften a little bit more by being exposed to ideas from some great speakers, teachers, researchers on sensuality, sexuality, reproductive health, health, optimizing our experience in a body, our relationships, a lot of science and a lot of spirituality blended in the show. So this week, I'm so excited to have Zoe Kors on the program because Zoe has a new book coming out called Radical Intimacy. Radical as in rooted, as in radish, as in in the ground, as in deep and at the core of a thing and intimacy, that kind of vulnerability and sharing and closeness that kind of makes life worth living, you know, so enjoyable. I met Zoe many years ago at Bhakti Fest in Joshua Tree. And what struck me about her was she has this deep grounded presence uh, where, you know, you can really feel her years of meditation practice and Buddhist training. You could feel the gentleness and sweetness that is reminiscent of the Ramda satsang. And you can also feel into her expertise and her care. She has, in addition to the grounded side, like this sparkle and this joy and this beautiful smile and these dimples and this lovely aesthetic. And she was at this festival teaching sexuality and and relationships. We obviously had a lot in common from the very moment that I laid eyes on her. And she was, before we even launched Rosebud Woman, the first person to say, I will absolutely share your things in a workshop with some other people. And I felt like I had a really wonderful ally. And over the last many years, she has continued her deep work in global teaching as a coach and a sexuality expert and intimacy expert and has put all of it into this book. Zoe is a sought after thought leader of intimacy and sexuality. Her book, Radical Intimacy, Cultivate the Deeply Connected Relationships You Desire and Deserve, is available wherever you buy books. She is the resident sex and intimacy coach and contributor at sexual wellness app Coral, and a former senior editor and creative director of LA Yoga Magazine, a contributor to Elephant Journal, Mind Body Green, Avocado Green Mattress, and Fabletics blogs. Her article, Six Ways to Have Radically Intimate Sex, quickly went viral and is currently at over 2 million views. She has a thriving private practice and offers her services through Center for Relational Healing, which specializes in the treatment of sex addiction and betrayal trauma. As a member of the CRH team, Zoe works with clients to reintroduce healthy sexuality and intimacy after the trauma of betrayal. Now, intimacy is, you know, obviously there's the kinds of things that we normally think about with our lovers. It's such an intangible. I was out doing some research to prepare for the show. And of course, social scientists are trying to find a way to get to agreement on what it is, like to create an instrument or a scale on which they can measure and assess just how close you feel with another person. And they came up with five statements that you could agree with or disagree with. And I thought we might try that just as a way to sort of get in the mood of feeling another, like feeling into them and noticing when you think of a person, how it impacts your body. So if you're willing to play with me, take a moment and imagine a person that you're close with in your life, uh, someone you're in relationship with perhaps, and bring to mind their face and their the feeling tone you have inside of yourself when you think of them or when you're with them and just kind of drop into their frequency. And then on a scale of one to five, one being I strongly disagree with this statement and five being I strongly agree with this statement. Let's do the five statements. Statement one, this person completely accepts me as I am. Agree or disagree? Number two, I can openly share my deepest thoughts and feelings with this person. Number three, 
This person cares deeply for me. Number four, this person would willingly help me in any way. And number five, my thoughts and feelings are understood and affirmed by this person. Those are some pretty basic intimacy questions. And the higher the score, like if you add up all your numbers, I agree with all these completely, it would be 25. And if I strongly disagree with all these completely, it would be five. So the higher the number, the more life satisfaction and other positive effects are showing up in in your life overall, not just in the relationship. People with the higher scores on this intimacy scale report less stress and pain and fatigue and more purpose and more belonging. It's not just the relationship that's better. It's our whole lives that are better. So Zoe in her book, In Radical Intimacy, writes on many kinds of intimacy, not just physical or relational, but also on energetic intimacy, for example, which we talk about a little bit later in the show. But I'll give you a taste of her writing She says, the three pillars of energetic intimacy are presence, humility, and curiosity. Presence is the ability to step out of subjective interpretation and into objective observation. It's the state of total, non-judgmental awareness, moment to moment. Humility is the willingness to suspend the idea that we need to do or know anything. It's state of surrender to being part of something bigger than ourselves. And curiosity is the eagerness to learn something new. It's the state of openness and interest. So with that in mind, let us bring our presence and our humility and our curiosity to this conversation with Zoe Kors. I start by asking her what she means when she says intimacy. Intimacy is the act of truly seeing and being seen for who we are beneath all of the stories that we tell ourselves, the images that we project, just being real and raw and speaking to what is happening as it is right in the moment. That sounds easy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think that the trick is to recognize that we have been conditioned in all kinds of ways to think about ourselves and about the context of the world and culture and our other people and between sort of expectations and distractions and denial and deflection, we are looking through a lens at ourselves and each other. So there's a call to action to sit in inquiry and start to peel back some of that conditioning and understand why it is that we think the way we think. Yeah, I think you say throughout the book in different ways that there's a very high price to avoiding feelings. Yeah. In terms of being able to truly be with another's actual reality or even your own actual reality, you have to sort of get comfortable with with feeling things that are uncomfortable. So can we talk a little bit about this connection between being willing to feel your feelings and being able to be intimate? Yeah, there's a relational truth that we can only meet each other to the extent that we can meet ourselves. And if we aren't able to be with our own feelings, we're not going to be able to be with our partner's feelings or our mother's feelings or our friend's feelings or whoever it is that we're in relationship with. We have to be able to understand what we're showing up with. So that involves really feeling our feelings and being honest with ourselves. You know, we're in a culture that has really sort of hammered the message that we should only feel good, good vibes only. You know, what's that t shirt and bumper sticker? You see that all the time, good vibes only. Yeah, that's fine, except that what do we do when we don't have good vibes? Isolate. Yeah, isolate, deny, suppress. Good vibes only is a trap. It's just not realistic. And and it's also a statement of privilege because there are plenty of people who are neurodivergent that don't have the opportunity to have good vibes only, you know. But none of us should be having good vibes only. It's part of the human experience to have difficult vibes. I had some very difficult vibes this last week. 
And I sat there trying to like control myself and be a queen and be more gracious than everybody else in the space and be like, I can hold all of this when I just wanted to actually like take a dagger or pen knife and stab this girl in the eye. But, you know, I was so cool. <laughs> I thought I was being so cool. And, and But energetically, I was doing it anyway. Someone told me that there is no privacy anymore. That you can be, you can have privacy that is like your the the facts are occluded from others, but energetically there's no privacy. Everybody feels what you're feeling. People know that there's something going on. Do you believe that? Yeah, I believe that. I believe that that you can't. That is, even if I try to mask my discomfort or my fatigue or my irritation with kindness or good vibes, that it's going to come through anyway to anybody who's got a breadcrumb iota of per of sensitivity or perception. Yeah. If somebody is feeling, and I say this to couples all the time, if one of you is feeling something and you're not taking ownership of those feelings, you're you're dumping it on your partner to feel. Like someone's going to feel it. You might as well feel your own feelings and be really clear and honor those boundaries. But, you know, otherwise you're just bringing a, a trash bag of all your feelings and handing it to your partner to feel. Right. So this you say you say in the book, the practice of radical intimacy starts with us. For sure. As a basis of a foundation for the way we interact with others. Right. You think about it. If you don't know yourself and you don't really know what you're feeling and, and why you're feeling it and what you're thinking, and then you go into an interaction with someone, you're just sort of, you know, wandering around in that dynamic and not really able to clearly communicate what's happening for you, why you're having this interaction, what you want from it, uh, checking in with whether you're in alignment with the person that you're interacting with. And that goes from a lover or the barista or, you know, anybody, a colleague. Yeah. So while we're, we're getting started on this, the component of the book, that's really the emotional intimacy component that you outline in the book, Price of Avoiding Feelings, be beginning with us. And, and you talk in there about some techniques that people can use to, to begin to identify their feelings. And one is this third person technique. Can you describe that a little bit for people? Yeah, it's, it's a common mindfulness technique that I think is really powerful. So there have been many people um, who sort of have different language for what Ram Dass called witness consciousness, right? Where you're able to sort of pull back and, and witness yourself and get some perspective. It's like a meta view almost. And Buddhists call that in some respect, it's similar to like absolute reality and relative reality. The relative reality is us in our lives, in our sort of human action, human interactions are um, moving about our day. And the absolute reality is sort of the larger context of in Buddhist philosophy. It's like sort of where we're all connected, where we all become one. So when you're having a reaction, in the book I use the, the sort of situation, the example of driving and road rage and being angry at the, the people who are driving terribly around you and being able to say like, take a deep breath. This is Zoe having a reaction. This is Zoe getting angry at this driver. This is Zoe making assumptions about the driver's level of entitlement to the road because they're driving an expensive car. And so they must be privileged and not really care about others. And, and this is Zoe thinking about how they must have voted in the last election. And this is, a, and you start to like uh, understand and be able to like uh, watch yourself going through the process of separating from the the actual feeling of frustration to like everything that you're making it mean. Yes. If I'm understanding it correctly, I'm sort of trying to stand outside myself and notice and name. And in that way, I'm getting more familiar with my own reactions, almost like I'm a narrator in my life. That's right. And then there was another, there was another piece. I mean, you're I wanted to touch briefly because you mentioned Ramdas that you this isn't something that was sort of you were born with. You've been cultivating awareness practices through your Zen Buddhist practice, through your community with Ram Das and the Neem Kurli Baba Satsang for a long time. And sort of how that feeds into your own understanding of intimacy, the sort of spiritual practices and awareness. Well, it all started with Alan Watts when I was in high school and he was on the radio 
at night and I would go to sleep every night with my clock radio with Alan Watts. And that was a huge awakening for me. And then I went to university and at university in my third year, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. I un unknowingly sort of navigated that episode of my life and the, the diagnosis and the treatment and all of that. I was 20 years old. I look back now and I realize how much Alan Watts sort of informed my ability to navigate that skillfully. I mean, as skillfully as a 20 year old can. That in and of itself was my first real intimacy practice, or at least it gave shape to it. I can point to, to times in my life in first grade where I was telling the truth about my experience, you know, my perception of a teacher not liking me and me wanting to move my class or me not wanting to stay in school and, and, and saying to the principal, you know, I'm not sick, but I want to go home. Well, they, they didn't were like, what do you do with that? This is a six-year-old girl, you know, telling the truth. We don't have that in our system. You're either sick or everybody knows that. And I'm like, okay, but so there's a, there's, I, I don't know if it's innate. I don't know if it's my parents. I don't really know what it is, but I somehow came into this world feeling like, like I had a, a responsibility to myself to speak my truth. Of course, that goes in and out of, of our lives, depending on our sort of psychosocial development. Um, you know, when you have a spiritual life, and, and it can be Ram Dass, it can be, you know, anything really, but when you're following a path and you have a, a spiritual life, you, you're, you know, you're sitting with yourself and, and the, the nature of existence and um, what it means and, and the sort of parts of yourself that you can't necessarily point to as scientific and evidence-based, you know, you're sort of dancing with the mystery and that's part of intimacy. For me, I suggest that, you know, I call it energetic intimacy, but that's sort of the, the final frontier of, of self-knowledge is being able to sort of have the humility and curiosity to name what you can't name. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, in order to be able to be with the mystery and name what you can't name, the, you, you talk a lot about the element of safety, you know, creating a safe container where like I get rigid, for example, when I don't feel safe, then I have to put up walls and protective barriers and like control the situation. And so there, there does seem to be something about it being an inside job of being willing to be with the mystery and also cultivating in the family or in the community or wherever you're at a sense that you can be seen and, and that it is this dance between the two. I love that you put through the whole book. I see you. I got you. I love you. How did you come up with that mantra, by the way, or that that phrase? You know what? It was. It really was sort of organically in workshop when I was working with people. Um, I used to do a lot of workshops around the time that I. I think we met originally at Bhakti Fest or Shakti Fest, and and I was doing workshops for like you know fifty, hundred, hundred and fifty people, and I would have them sit face each other and share with each other strangers. Like, you know, you could come with somebody and get away with sitting with them. But my request and my invitation was that you find somebody that you don't know, that you have never really met before and face them and, and find in yourself. I mean, we'd spend, you know, half the workshop sort of getting comfortable with each other and comfortable in that sort of setting and everybody's there to kind of work on themselves and have these experiences. So everybody seemed to be pretty willing. But then to share something with this person that is vulnerable, something that you that you don't normally share with people, maybe something that you haven't even really shared with yourself, a realization, something you want to let go of, something, you know, it depends on the topic of the of the workshop. But when these people, many of them women, like all female workshops, you know, where it's it's really very safe and, and non-threatening and a soft sort of energy in, in the room, I'd have them, after they share vulnerably, really sit and see each other, like for a good 10 minutes without speaking, just 
un, uninterrupted eye contact. And that is super intimate. I mean, it's, it's amazing how much more intimate eye gazing in that way can be rather than the sharing of words and, and ideas and stories. I mean, it's all important, but, but that's like a moment of real connection. And so after that, how do you, what is it that I'm wanting them to feel or, or experience? It's that feeling of like, I see you and I got you. Like, I see you, I can see you. I got you. Like whatever you have, whatever you're bringing here, I got it. I can hold it. I can be with it. You're safe to be whoever you are and wherever you are. I got you. And I love you. You know, like I love you. It's the old namaste. Like I, I love the, the, the part of me that I see in you and, and vice versa. That's that sort of thing. And it's become really my relational mantra and my mantra for my relationship with myself, you know, when I'm beating myself up or I'm feeling insecure or, uh, you know, lacking confidence or self-esteem or whatever, say to myself, like, look in the mirror, really look in the mirror, literally, and say, I see you, I got you, I love you. Like, that's powerful. It is. I, I have a friend, Mel Robbins, who did a book recently called, um, it's called High Five, I think. And you basically high five yourself. You look in the mirror and you high five yourself and you say, good job today or whatever. And, uh, and the practice of doing that, even for a week, is kind of like that. I see you and I got you. I love you. Um, in an affirmative way, you just are noticing the things that, were, that you did well for yourself that day. Even something as simple as that was powerful. Okay, so we're, we're still in the emotional side. I will say to everyone out there that uh, I have a friend who's um, in a male body who only knows the emotions of mad and sad and a couple of others. But, but there is a beautiful wheel of emotions, uh, core emotions, secondary and tertiary emotions that you have in the book. So so in part, it's it's also having language for what you're feeling. It's not just it's not just noticing it. it there, there's sort of a increasing dis discernment, fineness of description. Can you talk about that? Like how, how you get literate about emotions? Yeah, there is this um, wheel of emotion. I'm pulling it out right now so I can, I don't, I don't have the whole thing memorized. It's quite intricate. But like, for instance, there are this wheel of emotion, six core emotions. They're emotions, they're emotional. It's sort of the emotional landscape. So there's fearful, loving, joyful, surprised, sad, and angry. I just worked with, I just had a session right before we hopped on and it's a client who is angry and she's working with her anger and her anger is keeping her from being able to interact with her husband intimately on the physical realm. There's reason for her to be anger, angry. They have a long history together that I'll, I'll spare you, but I've been working with them and I can validate her anger. And she is wanting so badly to get rid of her anger. She wants to get past it. She's really, she feels like enough. She needs to let it go in order to move forward in her life with or without her husband. One of the things, I mean, the only real way to get on the other side of the anger is to really go deep into it and really sit with it and, and be with it. So my, my sort of invitation to her was to sit this week and ask her anger, like ask her body, where is the anger? Just sit in inquiry with the anger, the feeling of anger, the sensation of anger and start with the body. So like, you know, I feel a tightness in my chest. Oh, okay. Is it a tightness like a rubber band pulling tightness or is it like a squeezing a, a, a tube of toothpaste tightness? Like what is, what is the sensation and really sit with that? What does it have a color? Does it have a, a smell? Does it have a shape? What, what is it that you're, that you're working with? What is alive in your body that you're calling anger? You know, you can do this another way where you're angry about, you know, they have a conflict over coffee. They can, you know, she can really look at from the other end of it, you know, maybe this is, maybe she goes in the body day one and day two, you know, she's triggered over the coffee. So she looks at the coffee conversation and she starts to look at what it is 
that is triggering her and going down level layer by layer by layer by layer. So I'm angry because of this and I'm angry at that, uh, at the entitlement or I'm angry at the lack of compassion or I'm angry that I'm not a priority or I'm angry that I'm not seen and get that kind of story, understand what that is. All very, in the relational dynamics, that's all very accessible to us. We can all, we can all talk about what our partner is doing that's making us crazy, right? But then coming down layer by layer by layer, there are probably 10 layers until you get to like what values are being pushed up against, what boundaries are being violated, what do I stand for? What am I accepting in my life? How do I communicate that this isn't okay? How do I say, I'm angry at you? This makes me angry. I feel anger towards you. I love you. I'm angry at you and I love you. I'm angry at you because I love you. Because if I didn't give a shit, then I wouldn't even care, right? Like there's all of this sort of dynamic to anger and our relationship with the person, what we're making things mean, our relationship with ourselves. So you get to a point where you get sophisticated in your own self-knowledge so that anger, you're able to understand where anger becomes hostility, where it's impatience, annoyance, envious. How many times have you sort of been angry at somebody and it turns out you're just really envious of what they're doing or what they have or what they're projecting, right? Yeah, my ne my next episode is on sexual jealousy. Oh, wow. So believe me, I'm going to be angry about that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. No, this is great. So yeah, look at that wheel in there. And then the the other thing that you that you're offering people is sort of a way to these seven pillars of emotional literacy, which I loved by the way. I thought they were articulated so well. It's self-awareness, discernment, the, and then like, so now we're just about, okay, we did the meditations, we did the descriptions, we practice self-awareness. Now you're getting into discernment. But then these other ones, you're like moving it out and you're saying, okay, just because you feel it doesn't mean you get to spew it on everybody. You go into self-regulation. And I, that, that's another big one. And, and along with self-regulation, taking the responsibility for impact when you do have a strong emotion and you, and, and you want to express it like, just knowing that if it hurts other people in the way that you express it, your your or the responsibility for how you behave. Period. You know, you don't get just because you have a strong feeling doesn't mean you have free reign to weaponize it. Absolutely, and there's also a sort of a healthy part of that. Yes, just because you are angry doesn't mean that you get to say you know that you get to express it in a way that's not responsible, that's not skillful. But then there's also this other piece of responsibility for impact that we've all had situations where, you know, we have something to express that's that's uncomfortable, a difficult emotion to express or a point of view. And then we express it and then the other person is like rocked or shaken or offended or, you know, somehow sort of dysregulated. And then we get pissed that they're dysregulated, right? Where we have to be okay with rocking someone's world, even though like we're expressing a, a difficult truth or having a difficult conversation and they're going to be unhappy. We have to be okay with them being unhappy and, and the impact that we have caused. It's like, we're so busy trying to be comfortable or stay comfortable or make everybody else comfortable or expect other people to make us comfortable. And it's like, it can get messy and shitty and it's all okay. Yeah, I had to be actually quiet just to feel that for a moment. Like it can get messy and shitty and it's okay. You know, I think in my young life that was not okay. And so to let it be messy and to let that that unpleasant thing, that unpleasant truth hang out there and to watch it ripple does take a lot of being able to sit in the fire, as they say. Yeah sit in the fire or, or like ride the waves, you know, whatever, whatever metaphor you prefer. So what is our responsibility to others in expressing our feelings? You talk about empathy and reading the room in these seven pillars. I think that our responsibility, when we take responsibility for our impact or take responsibility for our, ourselves, I also talk about owning your shit. I think that there's a component of it that's really pretty 
essential if we're going to be skillful. And that is like, I'm over here. I'm having this experience. This is who I am. This is what I value. This is my perspective. And you're over there. And I'm, I understand that you may not be in that same place with me. You can't possibly be in my shoes, but I am going to say like, what's true for me. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about like, if it's a relationship, what I'm, what I'm needing, what I'm feeling, what my experience is of this dynamic that we have together. I expect you to hear me, see me. And I then want to hear and see you. And then I want to, you know, we're going to talk about the two of us, like how we're going to work this out, taking care of both of our our needs. And that might be that we can interact in a way that takes care of both of our needs, or it may be that this isn't working for us, one or the other of us or both of us. And if it's not working for one or the other of us, then it's not working for either of us. So it's like we have these expectations that people meet our needs but it's like, you know, there's, there, there's a conversation to have about like compromise. Can I meet your need that you're saying is your need without, without violating my own boundaries? Great. Like, let's talk about that. And let's talk about what you think you need and what you really need. And if there's another way to satisfy that need, you may think that you need me to cook you breakfast every morning because that to you me, makes you feel loved. I am not up for cooking breakfast every morning, but I'm happy to make you a cup of coffee every morning. Does that satisfy? Or what if I just look you deep in the eyes and tell you how important you are to me? Does that satisfy your need? Because that's something that I can do that feels more native to me. You know, and so we have these agreements with each other and, and, you know, we're half the time we have expectations are loaded with expectations of each other and they're loaded with covert contracts that you know where they're they're like these expectations and these things that we think that our partner has signed up for that they aren't even aware of yeah that that resonates a lot like one thing i notice is if i ask for what i want or f for boundaries uh it can trigger in the other person a sense that they're not enough or they're not doing something right and then I end up sort of navigating their shame spiral about not being enough and lose lose my ability. Like I was just asking for something simple that wasn't meant to be an accusation. And, and, and then I kind of get lost and I backtrack on my own request to sort of restore their well-being. Very common. Do you know what I mean? Very common. I think that's an ongoing process that like, it, look, the ultimate is when you have two people who are really have a high level of self-awareness and are willing to have these conversations with themselves and, and each other, but, you know, like are willing to look at themselves and own their shit, take responsibility for the way they're showing up. So when, when you have two partners that do that, it's, it's like you can start to learn each other's languages and learn where, you know, you might be able to then say like, I wanted something simple. I'm just asking, I think that you're running that, that old script in your head. And, and I'm not, I'm actually like, I want to let you know that you are enough. Otherwise I wouldn't be here. Like you said, it wouldn't be, if I didn't love you and I didn't want to be here, I wouldn't be making this request. Like it's clearly you're like enough and you're sexy too. So, Hey, how about this one thing that feels bad? Can we just work on that and not like turn it into like your, your six again? That'd be fun. <laughs> anyway, I love you so much for like, you know what I mean? You work with people all the time. It's like your six-year-old cannot be in charge of your whole life long. But so I try to, I try to like hold the things that really matter and, and make requests around those and mostly celebrate. Anyway, so now we've gone through this process. We've done, we've done our work. We have mastered, uh, sort of at least gotten to some level of competency on what we're feeling, on communicating it to others with the degree of sensitivity, sandwiched in between nice things so it's not all, you know, uh, negativity and we feel good about the relationship and we know that why we're willing to put ourselves through this dress is because we care about the person. I really feel like I've set the tone now if, in my emotional realm to be able to really want to have a rollicking physical connection without any withholds. And 
Now we get into the second phase of the book, physical intimacy. I learned a whole bunch of stuff in this section. One is the term pleasure positive society. And you even pick out some cultures in East Africa where women's pleasure takes precedence. So can we talk a little bit about what it would mean to have a pleasure positive society? Um, boy, this is a, an episode all its own. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know if it's rooted in, in our, you know, in Puritanism or sort of religious shame, but especially for women, we give men more latitude in feeling pleasure. You know, there's, there's a lot of like men are expected to, you know, to want pleasure and women are shamed for wanting pleasure. I mean, our deep, deep, you know, underpinnings of, of shame around feeling pleasure. We live in, in like a, a sort of procreational model of sexuality. Women are hypersexualized. We're taught that we need to craft ourselves to be desirable to men in the sort of patriarchy. That's all that really matters. And, and it's really about, you know, a man having his urges satisfied and those urges are really for pleasure and for women it's not at all a, a woman needs to be there to serve her man and to make babies you know i mean it, and it's not just our western culture i mean there's there are all kinds of cultures that really minimize the the um i mean rwanda and uganda aside there are other cultures that that sort of i mean look at Female genital mutilation. Yeah. Female genital mutilation exists as well to minimize, you know, female pleasure and sexuality. So, you know, what does it mean? It means that we're not focused on pleasure, that when, you know, sex education is taught, it's it's anatomical, it's, it's procreational, and nobody talks about uh, pleasure. But it just so happens for men that procreational sex and sex for pleasure is really amounts to the same thing. For women, for females, for people with vulvas, it's uh, pleasure is a lot more complicated. You can have sex uh, for procreation without pleasure. You actually have to uh, understand a, a female anatomy in order to really maximize pleasure and make sex a pleasurable experience for a body with a vulva. And that's not taught. And it's not taught in our de facto sex education called pornography either. So female pleasure is the most misunderstood sort of part of our physiology as human beings as anything. Yeah, like it's misunderstood from a physical perspective. And then also there's this other piece you mentioned, all this attachment myth, which is like, oh, women have pleasure only in the context of these long-standing romantic bonds and relationships, which adds a whole layer of like cultural shame to the physical ignorance. Like I've had, I've had a lot of pleasure in like a momentary encounter and, it, it, and I, where I didn't want to marry the person, you know? A hundred percent. I mean, I had like 12 years of blissful single dumb and you know, had some of my most powerful, amazing, intimate, connected experiences with people I, I didn't know. Well, I can't go that far, but I want to hear more. <laughs> so so um, listen, I know our time is short. We're coming up on the last few minutes of this. I, and we haven't even touched on the, the depths of the things in the book that are around the anatomical structures, the pleasure centers, all the kinds of those things in physicality, much less the stuff in the book on energetic exchange, uh, moving into the subtle body, which has a whole nother level of connection and like really feeling and knowing someone. So what I just wanna say to anyone who is interested in improving the quality of their relationships, this book is a primer, very thoughtful, uh, going between our emotional practices, our own self, everything that we're doing in the body with ourselves and with another person, and then moving into this field between us, which is not just with you and one other person, but with the, with a larger community. And that Zoe has put in the work. She has done a lifetime of practice with other people. She counsels and works with others and individuals, and she brings all of these wonderful stories to bear, which take the things that we've been talking about 
out of the context of the head and intellectualizing it and into really strong narratives that anyone can understand. You'll relate to the people in this book. So the book comes out next week. Um, I wonder if you want to talk a bit about how they can find the book and engage with you on the book. I think there's a podcast that's going with it also. Yeah, tell us about what how you see this book landing in the world and and how people can engage with you. My sort of hub is zoecores.com. I do have a podcast that is sort of an extension of the book and an opportunity to um, have conversations that are sort of related to all of this. That is the Radical Intimacy podcast. It's available wherever you listen to podcasts. The book itself is available wherever you buy books. You can walk into Barnes and Noble, you can go on Amazon, you can go to bookshop and independent booksellers. Um, and it, the audio book, which is in my voice, um, will be available on publication day at Audible or wherever you buy your audiobooks. And so that's that's basically how to find me. I love Instagram. That's really the only social media. I have a, a, a languishing Twitter feed and Facebook page, but really Instagram is, is where it's at for me. So I'd love for you to follow on Instagram. I reveal some, you know, personal stuff mixed in with some of my you know, workshops and, and offerings there. Yeah. You're like on Instagram, you're like the canary for the, the good ethical and moral response to what's happening in the world too. I like your feet so much. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> I will say if you're listening to this episode, the week that it's released, the book comes out next week, April 12th. So please pre-order it. It really helps, uh, aspiring authors when there's a big bump in sales on the first day and all those pre-orders tally to the first day. So uh, thank you so much, Zoe, for your dedication and your support of people in their personal growth, your advocacy for pleasure, emotional, sexual, and otherwise, and, uh, and for more than pleasure in a vacuum, but pleasure in sort of an accountable spiritual container. It's just a really beautiful blend of skills. Thank you so much, Christine. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Well, are you ready? Are you ready for more intimacy, more closeness, more presence with yourself and with the planet and with nature and especially with the people that are in your field, the ones you care about the most? Let us be with one another in this journey. Intimacy, like anything else, has a lot of different layers and flavors and takes practice. I hope you go out and find this book radical intimacy, cultivate the deeply connected relationships you desire and deserve, and get it. Give it. <laughs> if you like this episode, won't you please share it? Take a moment and send it on to someone on text or WhatsApp or Facebook or wherever it is that you tell people about the things that move your heart and mind. And you can come and talk to me at the.rose.woman. Or you can find Zoe and talk to her at Zoe Kors over on Instagram. I just started TikToking, which, you know, another thing to learn. Um, so I'm under the Rose Woman 108 on TikTok. Also, you know, my main work in the world and the way that I support this podcast is through this team of chemists and scientists and formulators and philosophers and marketers and designers and people who make beautiful, beautiful intimate wellness and body care products over at rosewoman.com. So come on, take a look at what we have to support your intimate practices, body oils for luscious massage, intimate moisturizers to keep things fresh, arousal serums, beautiful content and books and videos and things that Really, we hope will help everyone in our 100,000 person community drop in to their body more. Love your body, more joy, less suffering. So here I'm going to sign off and wish you more intimacy and connection than you could possibly imagine right now that it all unfolds for you perfectly. Peace and blessings. <laughs>